Coming up on iOS Today, Rosemary Orchard and I show you some very important settings that you may have missed on your iOS devices. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Coinbase. Cryptocurrency might feel like a secret or exclusive club, but Coinbase believes that everyone everywhere should be able to get in the door. Whether you've been trading for years or just getting started, Coinbase can help. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com iOS. Hello, we are back in our, well, I am back in my original place uh, after some technical difficulties last week. Luckily, things are more normal this week, and we have got a great show for you. Of course, this is iOS Today, the show where we talk all things iOS, tvOS, HomePod OS, Watch OS. It's all the OSs that Apple has on offer, and we love to share tips, tricks, apps, and more with you on the show. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I'm Rosemary Orchard. Hi, everyone. Hello, Rosemary, and welcome to yet another episode of iOS Today. So you uh, pitched this topic, and I thought it was a fantastic idea for a show. There are lots and lots and lots, and did I mention lots of settings on iOS and iPadOS oh, yeah. and all of them? And, you know, even those of us who use this technology all the time, who know very well how to use this technology, we miss some of these settings or we, uh, I, the case for me is that sometimes I will be talking to someone who's not steeped in tech and they'll be telling me about a thing they do on their phone or their iPad. And I go, wait, you, you use that? You, you actually use that? Which is also kind of fun to see like what people are using, what they don't care about, everything in between. Uh, but with that comes a whole host of features that maybe you didn't know were there or you didn't know what they meant or how to use them. And so we want to talk about some of those on iOS today today. So the first one uh, that Rosemary is going to talk about today is uh, making some adjustments to your screen size, right? Well, the, the stuff on the screen, not the actual screen itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, I don't have a magic trick for those moments where you're holding your iPhone, you're there going, you know, I really wish this was just a little bit bigger. Um, that, that <laughs> I, I'm afraid I can't magic the way I solve that. I carry an iPad mini. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's possibly not the easiest of solutions. But the first thing I want to look at today is the good old keyboard on your iPhone. Well, that's a fun little feature. Thank you, Ecamm. Let me just uh, try and fix that <laughs> one moment. So the keyboard on your iPhone is pretty good. Um, and if you go ahead and you type some words, um, I'm just typing some nonsense here, um, then you can, of course, use things like the spacebar trick where you tap and hold it, and then you can move your cursor around, which is a really useful trick that I wanted to throw in today because, you know, if we're talking about larger keyboards, then that's always a good idea. But, you know, sometimes you just actually need the keyboard itself to be bigger. And if you pop into the settings area and then under display and brightness, if you scroll down, then there should be the view option. And if you change this from standard to zoomed, it just increases the size of things a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. But then if we pop back here, it's really difficult to tell, almost imperceptible. But my keyboard is actually slightly larger. Um, and this might not make a huge difference for some of you, but Certainly, it will make a difference for those people who do just need a tiny little bit of extra space on their keyboard. Um, now, you meet, need to make sure, actually, sorry, that you set it first. Um, and then if your iPhone's like mine, it's actually going to reboot for a second um, to do that, at which point when it comes back on, then you will have um, a larger screen setting. And then if I pop into, I've got drafts here, then you can see everything's just a bit larger. Now this is, you know, it comes with a trade-off of you don't necessarily see so much on your screen. So for example, if I had lots of lines of text here, then I just wouldn't see as many of them. Um, but if you do just need a slightly larger keyboard, then of course you can do that. Um, and, you know, that, that can come in pretty handy. And I, I certainly have enabled this for both of my parents, my dad, and his permanent refusal to wear glasses, even though he desperately needs them, is frustrating. <laughs> but it, you know what? At the very least, he's not sending me text messages with weird typos in nowadays because it, it does get frustrating when that happens. And sometimes you do just need a little bit more space to tap those buttons. 
I agree. Um, there's a fantastic shortcut that our uh, pal Matthew Casanelli has created that I've used in the past. I can't remember if it's called Bigify or Zoomify, but it I love it. And it basically just makes all of the stuff on your like it, it turns on all of the accessibility features for uh, making the screen or the, the UI bigger and giving those kind of zoom features and letting you use those different tools. Uh, I really like to use that one. I've, I've talked about it before. Um, we'll, in fact, include a link in the show notes. I'll make a note to include that. All right. This next one that I want to talk about is, also involves the keyboard. And this is great, I think, for anybody once you know how to use it. Uh, it can be complicated to get set up at first. But once you get it set up and you realize kind of the power of this, then you are able to take advantage of a very powerful uh, feature on iOS, and that is the ability to do custom text replacement. So you probably are already aware of autocorrect on your iPhone, your iPad, etc. Some people are aware of it in a way that uh, they get very annoyed by it because it autocorrects things that they don't want it to autocorrect. And I know some people will turn it off. But with that, there's a feature that lets you uh, type in things that can then be uh, auto-corrected or suggested to uh, become other things. So my favorite example of this is on my iPhone, I have to type in my email from time to time. And sometimes websites don't properly give uh, the 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 field designation for a uh, field for an email. And so iOS doesn't automatically pop up with suggestions for my email. That's okay, though, because I've got some different shortcuts set up. I've got a text replacement shortcut. I've got one where if I type in, I think it's semicolon um, Gmail, then it will autocorrect to my uh, main Gmail account. Semicolon me, it'll autocorrect to my me.com account, et cetera, et cetera. But you can have these for all sorts of things. So we're going to go into the settings app, and we are going to go into uh, the keyboard area. So we tap, oh, let me switch over so you can see here. We tap on general and then we tap on keyboard. And inside of keyboard, there's an option for text replacement. And now you can see some of the options I have in here, uh, including the, um, uh, including ha ha, uh, but written in um, Chinese characters. Uh, my favorite one, which is the Kirby dance, if I type in K Kirby, then it will autocorrect it to the Kirby dance, which I use to type in some different things. F is, uh, you know, just typing in PHO obviously is not F. And so you can have it autocorrect to F. Uh, Pokemon fixes the E in Pokemon. I had a friend, uh, Sade, and her last name ended with the E. And so I changed that. Uh, you can see that I have some in here, like Sergeant. Uh, just staying the same. That's because if you have, a, this is a pro tip too, if any, if something autocorrects in your phone that you don't like, set up a text replacement to tell it. When I type this in, don't try to change it. When I type in lowercase s-a-r-g-e-n-t, I want you to put lowercase s-a-r-g-e-n-t uh, because what will happen normally is that it knows it's my last name and so it will try to capitalize the s. But I know when I want it capitalized or not capitalized, and so that's what I do. And then one of my other favorite ones, which is the shruggy icon, and so I have that there. Another one, trademark. Uh, if I type in TTM, then it'll change to the trademark symbol. Uh, if I misspell the, it'll change it. And then uh, Quadratic is saying in the uh, Discord chat um, that they do text replacement for email too. Um, at is their Gmail address. At at is their Outlook address. At 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 is their work address. I don't know if I'm starting to sound like Mars attacks. <laughs> um, and oh, so on and so forth. We'll have to uh, blur that out at the end there. Anthony, sorry, my address. Um, one of my favorite ones that's actually uh, uh, installed automatically is On My Way. Um, and that is OMW and it changes to On My Way. Uh, Scooter X also does the shruggy emoticon. Uh, for him, he, or uh, yeah, Scooter X just types in shrug with two G's and then it will appear. I did shrug with two S's 
and to make it appear for me. Um, so yeah, those are some of the different options that are available. I think text replacement on the iPhone is a lot of fun. Oh, oh let me show you. Um, so in the top right corner, this is how you add one. Uh, in the top right corner is the plus icon. And the phrase is the thing that you want to have come up as the text replacement. The shortcut is what you want to type in to have that come up. So let's say... Um, I'm trying to think of something that uh, regularly happens. Let's say you regularly get asked, um, what is the address for your, um, you, what is, what's your address? So we'll just make up a fake address. 1100 Bios Lane, um, apartment 1010. Uh, technology, California, one zero one zero zero. And then I can change the shortcut to be, uh, semicolon. And normally I would do ADD as my address, but I've already mm -hmm. got that one set up. So, uh, here we'll just do, um, AAD. I know that that's wrong, but for the sake of this, uh, we'll do that. And then we tap save and then now, if I were to, and once again, that's going into an area I don't want. If I were to type in, in any text field, I'll just do it up here, semicolon AAD, then you can see down here at the bottom in the middle, it has uh, suggested that address for me. So a very fun, I think it's a fun feature that has mm -hmm. all sorts of implications. And if you are a user of uh, text expander on your Mac, like I am, then you're very familiar with doing snippets. I do snippets all the time. Um, yeah, same. And so it was great to have it on iOS as well. Yeah. One tip I will give people um, who are looking at doing this is, first of all, don't forget, you can copy and then you can paste into that phrase field. And the shortcut is optional, which is great for, you know, things that are just spelt weirdly. I've got some friends who've got surnames, which are very similar to real words, but they're not the same. And uh, this this forces iOS to get it right. Um, but what I do do is I often start my uh, my snippets with a Z because that is on the same keyboard as the, all the letters that I'm going to be typing. Because if you think about it, even if you use the the tap and hold and swipe and let go feature, uh, which I'm guessing some people might not know, so I'm just going to show that, that again. Um, so if you tap on the number, you swipe to an uh, a punctuation mark and then you let go, it, it bounces back to um, the 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 regular letter keyboard. Even with that, it's a little um, longer, but Z is one of those letters that at least in the British English language is less frequently used. You could also use Q because it's it's right here at the top of your keyboard to trigger these, uh, but less frequently letters that are used to start your snippets is probably a good idea because this way you can easily remember, oh yeah, it shrugged with a Z um, because I always forget, I have this really cute one set up for Reddit eyes. Um, so I get these little eyes going, huh? What's going on here? Um, <laughs> but I always forget it's there. So maybe if I put it under Z, then it'll pop up more frequently. Yes, uh, perhaps it will. All right, what's the next one we want to share with folks? Well, the next one I want to share with people is perhaps less relevant for us here in the UK, but more relevant for a lot of you in the US, and that is the TV app. And specifically sports scores. And actually this, this feature translates, fortunately for everybody involved, to the Apple TV as well. Though I can't show that here today because getting an Apple TV onto my screen, unfortunately is not something I was able to do for today's show. But in the settings app, if you go to the TV section um, and then you scroll down, then you can toggle off show sports scores. So if you're watching something a little bit later, um, then you can toggle off the, the scores so that you don't accidentally see them. Which of course, you know, if you don't want any spoilers, is probably a pretty good idea that um, there are also some other options here like um, allowing the use of mobile data for streaming and so on if you have a limited data plan then you will want to toggle that off um, and leave that off um, so that you can you know make sure that mobile data isn't being used for downloads or for streaming um, which is what I have there the, this is mostly to prevent me from going completely insane by just streaming Ted Lasso back to back wherever I am <laughs> uh yeah i have that turned off because i not because i worry about spoilers but because i don't uh care about it and so i always go and and remember to turn that off before it gets in the way <clears throat> um the next one I wanted to talk about is there are loads of ways to make this happen. I should be clear, uh, especially with shortcuts, actual shortcuts for uh, for 
the like through the app but um a simple way that's existed for a while to control music playback uh when you're going to sleep or any media playback when you're going to sleep is with the clock app um there's a nice little setting that's kind of buried because it's at the bottom of the device uh at the bottom of the screen if i tap on clock and i choose timer I can set the timer for, say, um, 30 minutes, which means I want to play my podcast or my music or my audiobook for 30 minutes. And when the timer ends, you'd think that these are just full of different uh, chimes and ringtones. And that is true. You do have chimes and ringtones. But at the very bottom, there's also an option called stop playing. If you choose stop playing, then what happens is at the end of 30 minutes, Whatever's playing on your iPhone will, you got it, stop playing. So this is a great way to simply, without needing to mess around with anything, to understand how all of that works, to use an in-app uh, sleep timer, any of that. If you just need a sleep timer super quick, this is a great way to get it. Uh, just head into the clock app, choose timer, change when timer ends to stop playing, and there you go. Now, pro tip, make sure... You double check this because you don't want it to, you don't want to think that this is like, it, it's going to, you know, your egg timer. And so then in, uh, in, in 10 minutes, whenever the egg timer goes off, nothing happens and your egg ends up getting overboiled and then you're sad. Make sure that uh, when timer ends is changed back to radar or another sound after you're done, because this is only to get the thing to stop playing whatever's on your iPhone. All right, Rosemary, next tip from you. Well, next tip from me is something I'm hoping a lot of people have got enabled. But again, having a look at some of my friend and family's devices, maybe not. And that is scanning QR codes through the camera. So under settings in the camera section, if you have a look down here, as well as doing things like enabling things like a grid and mirroring your front camera, if you want to, there is an option near the top for scanning QR codes. And there's also an option for showing detected text. And what this means is when you then swipe into the camera, however you choose to get there, I'm going for control center, then if there's a QR code around, which of course, naturally, I don't have one to hand, then it will immediately pop up and let you just tap on it to go to it. But also it can try to detect text. So I happen to have a little box here um, from a USB hub that I needed to purchase. And it's going to have a go and try and detect the text there for me. Now, it's probably going to struggle a little bit just because of the lighting setup in here. But there we go. It's detected the text for me. Um, and so it, it, it works really well, I have to say. It's even better um, at things like uh, QR codes. Um, but then I've got this little icon down in the bottom and it's showing me that text. And then I can copy this, select it, or I can look it up. Um, and of course, the lookup is is pretty nice when uh, you need to do things. And of course, this is highlighting how cheap this USB hub was, Micah, because look at that typo. Ultra. I, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. <laughs> but your camera can do more than you thought is basically what I want to say. Um, and so don't forget in camera settings, have a look um, at options. So you can use volume up for burst mode as well, which, you know, it's, it's great if you want to be able to take lots and lots of pictures and have it, um, you know, it's taken 16 photos there, uh, all of which I'm going to have to delete at the end of the show. Um, and you can change things like the formats and stuff as well, but make sure you've got scan QR codes and show detected text on. If you find that you take a lot of pictures and it's always detecting uh, QR codes and you really, really, really hate that, but you do want an easy way to uh, do this, then in the control center, then there is an option that you can have for scanning QR codes. There's a code scanner and I've got it added right here. And this, when you tap it, it looks like the camera, but it's specifically looking for a code. Um, and so there, that's, that's two different ways that you can do that. Personally, I like having it in the camera because from the lock screen, when I unlock my phone, it's just, oops, an easy swipe over to the right. And then bam, I can scan my QR codes or read some text if I need to. Nice. I dig it. Um, all right. The next one I want to talk about is one that I actually ended up uh, showing last night. Um, some folks might not be aware that you can, in the same way that if I'm on a, on a, on a, 
PC, I can hit Command F while I'm in the browser and search the page uh, to find text in a page. You can also do that on Safari on your mobile devices. And it's actually quite simple. And it turns out there are two ways. So I learned something new this morning when I was going to grab the, um, the support article from Apple about how to do this. I came to discover that there are two ways to make this happen. So we're all learning today. Um, the first way to make this happen, and I'll go with Apple's uh, method first. This is the one that I didn't know before we go with mine, which I think is easier. Um, if you are looking for specific text on a page, then you can tap the share sheet icon down at the bottom. The share sheet icon, uh, for folks who might not know, is a rounded square with an arrow pointing up out of it. So I'll tap that share sheet icon. It brings up the share sheet, and then I will choose find on page. Now I can type something in like say Facebook, which is all over this page. And you can see that it shows uh, that there are 10 total, uh, 10 total entries on this page that it's found. So tapping the up or down arrows will take you to each of those uh, different versions. Now, that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is by typing a piece of text into the URL at the top. So mm -hmm. I can type in T-E-S-T, -E and then normally it shows these different Google searches you can do, test and internet speed, testosterone, and testosterone, uh, as well as pages that you may have visited in the past. But the last setting here is on this page, find test, and then it will find that page for you, or it will find that uh, entry for you. So yeah. there are, again, two different ways to make that happen. I'm familiar with the second one. I didn't mm -hmm. know that the first one was there. So that's nice. Yeah, I think the first one was only added, I think maybe last year in iOS 14, Micah, um, because I've always used the typing in the search bar version. Or if you're on an iPad with a keyboard attached, a physical keyboard, or in fact, on an iPhone with a physical keyboard, the command F function will let you search within a page or a document as well, which is quite nice. But Personally, I usually just type in the address bar. Yes, uh, same here. All right, tell me about your next one. Uh, well, my next one is actually, I've just reshuffled based on something that I saw right when you were doing that tip, which is that you can modify the share sheet. Um, and hiding people in the share sheet is something that comes up fairly frequently. So I am just going to open something on my iPhone that I can easily share to show people what currently happens. So I have uh, just an, an empty draft in the drafts application here. And if I use one of their many actions, then I can, if I can type correctly, just go ahead and share this. And this works the same way as the share sheet in Safari or anything. But if you share, then when it comes up with the share sheet, of course, my iPhone is uh, struggling. It's got all these people at the top, right? And sometimes if you don't want people there, then you can tap and hold on somebody and say, suggest less and it'll get rid of them. But um, that, that, that extra row, kind of a waste of space sometimes, I think. So let's go over to the settings app because in settings, you can actually control this. And if you actually go into Siri, oops, not face uh, ID and passcode, Siri and search. And then if we scroll down, then we can toggle off show when sharing. And this is under suggestions from Apple. Um, and you can actually toggle off a whole bunch of different suggestions here, like ones that appear in Safari and so on. But if I toggle off show when sharing in this share sheet, I go back here and it looks like it hasn't changed. But let's just trigger the share sheet again. And bam, look at that. My contacts are gone and I've just got this row of apps here. And then, of course, I have uh, all of the different actions below, of which I have many. Um, and don't forget, you can always uh, swipe right to the end, uh, be that on the right of the app row or to the bottom to modify um, the uh, the share sheet for you. But this is another way that you can get something out of there if you don't want your contacts showing up every time you share. Nice. All righty. I love it. But uh, we do need to take a quick break. Uh, I want to tell you this episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Coinbase. Yes, very exciting. If you've been looking to level up your financial portfolio, it's always good to diversify. Why not think about cryptocurrency? Backed by the world's leading investors, Coinbase keeps your portfolio safe and secure while adding crypto into your mix. Coinbase offers a trusted and easy-to-use platform to buy, 
sell, and spend cryptocurrency. They support the most popular digital currencies on the market and make them accessible to everyone. They offer portfolio management and protection, learning resources, and a mobile app so you can trade securely and monitor your crypto all in one place. Millions of people in more than 100 countries trust Coinbase with their digital assets. I'm one of those people. Whether you're looking to diversify, you're just getting started, or you're searching for a better way to access crypto markets, start today with Coinbase. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash iOS. It's very important that you head to that URL in particular if you want to check this out. Sign up at coinbase.com slash iOS for $10 in free Bitcoin. This offer is for for a limited time only, so be sure to sign up today. Once again, that's coinbase.com slash iOS. And of course, our thanks to Coinbase for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS Today. All right, let's see what we have left. This is a great uh, tip, Rosemary. I have a trillion apps on my phone because of a show I do called iOS Today. And I don't yep. use all of my apps and I would like to have more storage space on my device. Can you help me? Um, yes, yes, I can, Micah. And so I'm just going to grab uh, one of the 8,001 apps that I'm not using. And I'm just going to put it on my uh, home screen so I can demo two different ways to do this to people. Um, and there is a little bit of a caveat, as you will see. So first of all, if you want to offload a specific application, this means that the application will still be on your device. Like it's sitting there, so it's easy to get back, but it's not necessarily showing up on your home screen or in the app library. Yes, I have a lot of badges in there. That's okay. Then if you tap and hold on the app, then you can remove the app and you can either just remove it from your home screen, which kind of gets rid of it, or you can delete it entirely. And if you want to keep it around, you just don't want it on your home screen, then by all means, check it in the app library um, and, and remove it from your home screen. You will find uh, when when we go to remove, for example, the mail app, I can actually delete this one, but uh, I think there are some native Apple apps that you can't do that with. But in uh, my settings, and of course, if you're looking for one of these settings, this is another bonus tip for people and you can't remember where something is, don't forget there's a search function. I wanted to double check that offload unused apps is indeed under general storage. So I typed in off and here we are. Um, so here it's going to take a moment to load and it's going to go, hey, Rose, you've got a lot of data on your phone. Yes, I do, especially because I've recently downloaded a whole bunch of my music. Um, but if we scroll down in here, then we should get the option to offload unused apps. Um, and so if I scroll down to the bottom, then I've got a lot of apps with little clouds next to them because these ones aren't Is on my iPhone. Me? They've been offloaded. Um, and then I can tap on any individual app to offload it. So if I don't want these classic Mac stickers from Apple, then they can just go away. Um, and of course, it can automatically do this as well. Um, and there is indeed a setting for that. And I want to say that that is not under storage. Um, so uh, there we go. Sorry, I'm having a notification pop up. Uh, so if I just type in offload again, then it should show me the other place in the setting where this is. And if we pop into the App Store, then you can see there's a toggle here for offload unused apps. And this will automatically get those apps off of your iPhone um, when you are running out of storage space. And iOS tries to be smart about this. It uses those apps or it gets rid of those apps that you have used less frequently. Um, and things like, for example, those apps that maybe you downloaded once because you needed to get into a restaurant somewhere um, and that's how they were doing the ordering system. And then, so you downloaded it, but you've not used it in six months. Well, that's gonna be one of the first to go when your iPhone starts running out of storage space. So to download or re-download one of these um, apps, of course, under in the settings, if you look under storage, then you can find those offloaded apps and you can see all of them right at the bottom of this list. If you scroll down, I mean, your list, if you don't host iOS today, is probably going to be a little bit shorter. Um, and it will also show you, for example, under highlights, it shows last used because I actually used that on this device. Um, and so therefore more recently than some of the others, which just don't have that data associated with it. So if I look at this, then I can tap here to reinstall the app. 
But if I search for an app um, and I search for, say, PDF expert, then you'll see here there's a cloud icon as well. And just tapping on that will immediately start to re-download it, um, which, of course, gives me the option to, uh, you know, just sit there and wait for a moment. And then everything will be back to normal in no time at all. Yay! We love it. All right. Um, the other one that I wanted to talk about, this one I shared on... Um, on Smart Tech Today, uh, it's just an interesting set of features that I did not know existed. And what's kind of funny is that uh, there are there are a lot of articles out there. I found this one article talking about different um, codes that you can type into your phone and have things pop up. And then in looking up more, I found another article that was just quoting the first article, which was quoting another article, which was quoting another article, and it just kind of went back and back and back. Um, but these are different codes that you can use to kind of see some of the behind the scenes stuff on your phone, as it were. Uh, before iOS 15, you were actually able to get a numeric value of the... Um, of the, the signal on your phone. You could see kind of what the, the signal uh, value was. But these days, it's not quite the same. Um, or as of iOS 15, it's not quite the same. But still a very interesting uh, feature. So what we'll do is um, if we want to show this Tom's Guide article, there's the one that a lot of people already know about. It's how to find your IMEI on your phone. Um, if you don't know about that one, then they'll they'll typically tell you in uh, during a support call how to find your IMEI using that. There's also the ability to hide your caller ID, which some of you may be familiar with. But the one that I wanted to talk about specifically was launching field test mode on iPhone. So if I uh, type in this code, it's and it's, bear with me because it's kind of a, a long one. Asterisk three zero zero one pound one two three four five pound and then you hit call it will take you to this field test screen now there's not a lot here that i understand um the, it's it's just a bunch of info that doesn't make any sense to me but it is kind of cool that you can go in and see these different things so uh, i would imagine that if i had a dual sim phone that part that says at&t which is the carrier that i use if i were to tap that would probably let me switch between those carriers i can manage the dashboard so i can choose some other things to add or remove from there and then if i tap the list in the top right uh, there's even more information. RAT, which I don't know what that is. Maybe that means ratio, rate. I can tap sell info and get some information that get some information there. I can see information for 5G, the frequency band stuff, LTE, and then miscellaneous, including cellular rat retention, which, as I said, I don't think is about holding on to uh, small rodents, uh, cellular service status, and registered plumbing status as well. There are all of these different fun uh, screens. Again, this doesn't really doesn't really uh, give me very much information as a person who's not like a cellular tower operator, but I think it's kind of fun um, just to, to get a, a behind the scenes pick uh, and view of your phone. The other thing that um, the the article talks about is like diverting incoming calls. There are some ways to do some of these in the phone settings for your phone, but not all of them in exactly this way. So you can forward calls when you don't answer. You can forward your uh, calls when your iPhone is unreachable, and you can forward your calls when your iPhone is busy. So all of those are different options that uh, it doesn't necessarily sort of separate between in the, the settings option. Um, you can set up call waiting, which you are able to do just in the settings. Um, and then there's one that I think will be popular for parents um, of, of very small kids, which is preventing outgoing calls on your iPhone. Uh, you can actually lock it so that no one can make a call until you type in the proper code afterwards. So uh, asterisk 33 asterisk and then hitting the power. So let me try that again. Asterisk 33 asterisk, then typing in a four digit pin and then the pound sign and then hit call. That will stop outgoing calls. Then in order to undo it, you 
basically type in the exact same thing again. But here's the important thing. Do not forget what pin you type in because otherwise you won't be able to make outgoing calls. So yep. those are a few fun little secret codes you can use. Uh, and they're going to be ones that are specific to certain carriers and other codes that may work on your phone that don't work on others. There were some of the codes that did not work for me. Uh, and again, depending on which version of your operating system you're running, that can also make a difference. Yes. Yeah. And also don't forget the country that you're in can make a difference as well. I know that over here I have certain numbers uh, and there are some of the things that appear in here that I actually need to text to a certain number for my provider on my current provider, but maybe on a different provider, it would work differently, uh, which is, of course, always a possibility with these. I do have one more that I want to share, Micah, because I don't know about you, but I feel like I get a lot of notifications. I'm just going to swipe open uh, my home screen here and show you. And oh my gosh, that's a lot of notifications. And I've deliberately left my lunch reminder running here for a reason, because sometimes I don't actually want previews of all this stuff. I just want to know that this app has sent me a notification because you know what, that's good enough and I'll check in on it later. Um, and so the one that I have chosen to do for this, which is why I still have that lunchtime reminder running is do, because what you can actually do is you can turn off previews and you can have previews show always when your phone is unlocked, which is the default option. And of course, if you have face, unlock, face ID and an Apple Watch and you've set the Apple Watch unlock to uh, be enabled, which don't forget, if you recently got a new Apple Watch, you will need to re-enable for that. Um, then you can, of course, um, you know, easily see your previews all the time, even when your phone's lying flat on your desk next to you, for example. Um, but what, I, what you can also do is just never show a preview. So now if I go back, I can just see I've got 9G notifications and it'll take me to the specific notification when I tap on it, but it doesn't show me the preview details. And that can be really useful if you've got some apps which maybe have a little bit more uh, sensitive information in them. So for example, uh, if you uh, get a lot of uh, very important email at work, then you probably don't want people seeing exactly who it is that's emailed you um, to, you know, and accidentally disclosing information. For example, if you're a medical practitioner, having your patients email you is probably okay, but having that information accidentally displayed to anybody who happens to walk past your iPad, hmm, not so good. So you can disable mm -hmm. those notification previews for that, which is quite handy. And of course, I now need to remember to re-enable notification previews for due, because otherwise I'm not going to know what reminder that is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. I like that. Uh, I, I think that's such an important setting that folks need to check out um, and, and, you know, understand how that works and how there are different settings for it. Uh, yes. Let's move on to talk about uh, the news. Up first, we should talk about a little bit of a, a look back on the past uh, with the introduction of the iPod. I remember back in college, uh, I took a public speaking class and we had a bunch of different types of, of speeches that we had to give an informative speech, a persuasive speech, and I can't remember what the third one was, some sort of presentation. Um, but the uh, informative speech that I gave was about um, the introduction of the iPod and how it revolutionized music and uh, made all of the difference. Was it a thousand songs in your pocket? Um, with the introduction of the, uh, the original iPod, it was this small device with a tiny little hard drive inside that lets you store your music and take it around with you, just placing it in your pocket or in a bag or in some cases a, an iPod sock. And uh, the, the the click wheel and and the uh, ability to store so many songs at once. I, I can remember um, every year when new iPods were coming out, and you know each year that they would change it and update the design. And uh, you know some people had the new iPod Nano, and then iPod Nano with video, and all of these different devices that came out over time. The iPod Shuffle, which I loved, it was such a great little clever device. All these different iPods. Um, with a bunch of yeah accessories from third parties and the that colorful um, iPod marketing that they had, where the the person was was in some sort of colorful silhouette, and they had this white iPod in their hands with the headphones running into their ears. It was iconic. Um, I remember fo fondly my different iPods that I've had, and I imagine Rosemary, you do too. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. That the iPod was actually my first ever Apple product. I had the, the white iPod nano click wheel. This came before they started doing the colors. Um, but obviously it came after they'd started doing, um, you know, color screens on the iPod because that was, that was a whole thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember, you know, I think the first Apple product I ever encountered was somebody's iPod shuffle at school, like the, the USB stick one. Um, and, uh, yeah, he w- he had the rubber case on it and he was bouncing it on the desk to show off how how sturdy it was. I don't know if it actually survived that. I seriously never saw it again. Um, but uh, yeah, if it weren't for the iPod, then you and I might not be here uh, talking about the iPhone and the iPad and, you know, all of these other things. I've still got an iPod Nano that I've got a bunch of audiobooks loaded on that I just keep in my travel bag because audiobooks are a great way to pass the time if you run out of everything else to do. Absolutely. Um now we should talk about the introduction of iOS 15.1, which mm. is here uh, featuring SharePlay. Um, so iOS 15 launched a little while back and then at Apple's recent event where it announced new MacBook Pros. Uh, it Shortly after that, we learned that 15.1 would be rolling out with some of the features that were missing in the original one. Um, SharePlay is this cool new feature for iOS that lets you, or for for multiple, uh, all of Apple's different uh, OSs, that lets you use FaceTime to not only do the normal connection with other folks, but also to participate in different activities, games, uh, movie viewing, television viewing, music listening, all sorts of different uh, experiences where you get to share uh, in the play of be it a game or another piece of media. Uh, Lots of different apps are um, coming out with updates that feature share play functionality. And in fact, Rosemary and I will be uh, doing an episode about uh, share play features, but we'll, we'll get to that uh, soon. And, um, yeah, you wanted to to, uh, to mention the introduction of some new Apple Music playlists and maybe some other yeah. features from iOS 15. Yeah, actually, the first one I wanted to talk about is something that's been in iOS in some form or another for a while already, and it's called Announce Notifications. And if you've had a, a car with CarPlay enabled and you've had your phone connected to it... Um, and messages have come in, then you'll probably have found it announcing messages to you and saying, you know, there's a text message from this person saying this, whatever, would you like to reply and so on? Well, now you can have this whenever you're connected to uh, your AirPods for things like messages and calls. And Apps can integrate with this as well. So for example, Telegram and WhatsApp, I found for me, at least during the beta period, have been announcing notifications. Um, so this is another thing that you can announce, uh, announce, enable in the settings app. So I'm just going to pop back over to that uh, so that I can show everybody. And so under settings, uh, if you scroll down once more into the Siri and search section, then you've got announce calls and you've also got announce notifications. And you can uh, do some toggling here. Um, you can turning, turn off reply uh, with a turn on reply without confirmation. So by default, whenever it announces one of these notifications, um, then it's going to pause for a little bit for you to immediately start replying. Other than that, then you can, you know, reply using the Hey, Apple lady command that I won't say in case I trigger everybody's home pods. Mm-hmm. Um, but then if you scroll down and I'm just going to go all the way down to messages, hopefully is here. Um, messages is on. Then I can now allow all messages or I can just allow time sensitive and direct messages. Um, and you'll have to have a poke around in the individual apps to see um, which ones, um, you know, you, you, you want to toggle on and off um, and, you know, what kind of announcements that you want there. But, one other thing that you can slash might want to do here is in the control center, there's an option here for announce notifications, um, which you can put in your control center. Um, and then when you're connected to headphones, which of course I'm not right now, so it's not going to work, then there's this button here, which I'm tapping to make it light up. It won't do anything because I don't have any AirPods connected to this iPhone. Um, but if I did have AirPods connected, it would toggle on announce notifications. And then when you turn it off, it stays off until the next day. Um, which is a nice feature. And I find, especially if I'm doing housework um, and so on, and I, I put my iPhone down, but I'm messaging people. This way, it's not a case of having to dash back to my phone every couple of minutes to check whether or not I've got a message. Um, I will hear if I've got a message and have it read to me, which is very nice. That is very nice. I uh, I end up turning this off a lot because for me, I don't... Um, 
ne- end up needing it when I, it's mostly because I'm listening to audiobooks and I don't like that to be interrupted. Oh, but yeah. there yeah. are occasions where this is a very handy feature if you're walking, um, if you are yeah, out and about, if your hands are, are busy doing other things, this is a great way to, uh, to get that notification. Um, we've got a few more news stories here in just a moment before we move on to Shortcuts Corner. All right, uh, a couple of more news stories. The first one here is that uh, Apple has officially updated its App Store guidelines. Now, you may be wondering as a consumer, uh, as opposed to a developer, and we have some developers who tune into the show, but particularly those of you who are you know, app downloaders, you may be going, um, why do I care about this? Well, that's because it does affect you. Um, Apple has updated its App Store guidelines to make it um, so that it is easier uh, for third-party apps to be able to offer different forms of payment methods. Um, it also works well. It, it's it's spe- excuse me. It's specific to communication about specific forms or about other forms of payment methods. So it's a little bit confusing on the wording, but it gives developers uh, the opportunity to say, "Hey, I saw you signed up for this account." Um, if you would like to check out our subscription service, here is where you go to do so. So in the app, you type in your name, your email, uh, the password that you want for the account, and then they could email you and say, now, if you want to try out the premium version, then you need to head to this link and do that. Um, in the past, if different apps did that, they could get uh, rejected from being able to be published in the App Store. So just some subtle changes there that I think uh, will continue to sort of iron themselves out over time. Yeah, yeah. It's one of these things where we're going to end up seeing some changes come. There will be some apps that make it through App Review, as always, that maybe aren't following what Apple still uh, still um, has within its guidelines. And there'll be some apps that don't make it through. But in a couple of months, I suspect we'll have a much better sense of how this affects us. But in the meantime, you know, keep an eye out for uh, all of those changes coming your way. Um, there was something else I spotted, which I know we get a lot of questions about in general, um, and we don't answer the same question every single week just because it it wouldn't make sense to, um, but about using your iPhone as a web camera. And there is an app called Epoch Cam, which lets you use your iPhone as a web camera with some AR snap lenses. So sort of uh, Snapchat style, um, you know, ears or hats and and filters, et cetera. Um, And this is available now. And I, I, I gave this a little play. I'm not using it for the show uh, for a number of reasons, but um, it, it seemed pretty good when I was giving it a go. It's it's from Elgato, the same people who make the the Stream Deck that Micah and I use to actually switch between all of these scenes as we go um, throughout the show. But it's it's pretty cool. I I like it. Uh, I don't know if you're going to see me next week, with Bunny Ears, Micah. What do you think? <laughs> I think it would be fun if we did some virtual app caps. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, let's we might have to try at some point. All right. Yeah. Maybe next uh, week. This, there you go. We'll we'll have to see. So stay tuned for that. There could be some virtual app gaps coming up. Um, this is yeah. The Epic Cam has been around for a little while uh, as its own independent app. It was purchased by Elgato and uh, improved upon, made more powerful. Um, I like that Snapchat's. I think it's really interesting that Snapchat is sort of a um, media platform as well or a content platform as well, where they, uh, with access to their API, are able to give other uh, camera services the ability to connect to that. Um, I'm I'm a personal fan of Camo Studio as the tool for turning an iPhone into a webcam. Um, it doesn't have, you know, those kinds of features in it. Epic Cam is definitely, uh, I think aimed at the sort of influencer crowd and uh, the streamer crowd for sure. Uh, but yes, I think it would be kind of fun if we did some uh, virtual <laughs> some virtual app caps soon. And then the last thing we want to mention is that um, Apple One Premiere, which is uh, a the, you know the most premium version of Apple's subscription service, did not originally uh, launch in 
every country, as you might imagine, and in, it still continues to not be available in some countries, but it is uh, expanding to 17 new regions starting next week. Uh, Rosemary, did you already have access to Apple One Premiere? I or did, is... yeah. So okay. fortunately, this is already available in the UK, so I've been using it here for a while. Um, but for those people who who weren't previously able to access it, I'm, I'm sure they'll be very pleased. I know th I noticed here that the Netherlands is suspiciously absent on this list, which is a real shame because I've got some friends in the Netherlands who are uh, quite frustrated about the uh, the lack of this. If, it, if it's not already there, I know they were saying something about uh, translations and Apple Fitness not being uh, quite the way they hoped. So hopefully, fingers crossed, all oh, of this will roll yeah. out and be more international in no time at all. We can only hope. All right. Uh, let us move on to what is it? Shortcuts Corner. Wow. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Shortcuts Corner, the part of the show where you write in with your shortcuts requests and the shortcuts expert, Rosemary Orchard, who is wearing a very cool, I think, sweater. Is that a sweater? That's or it's a jacket? dress, actually, Micah. It's oh, a, it's my a dress, goodness. I a knee length it. gray dress. I love it. It's so warm and cozy, but it's also not too warm. I'm amazed. Yeah, I that that pattern and the texture, very good. Um, sorry, I got distracted by that. I like, I want that dress. Um, anyway, Shortcuts <laughs> Corner, Rosemary Orchard, the Shortcuts Expert, is here to answer your Shortcuts questions. And uh, it starts with uh, Daniel, who writes in saying, thank you for answering my question on the show. Daniel had asked about playing audio when launching the Books app, but only when at home and not if the Books app was already playing. Daniel said, I want to let you know that I set up my automation following the information you provided, and it works exactly as I want it to. It only plays my playlist when I'm on my home Wi-Fi and when audio is not already playing. Yay! I wish I had the, there's like that sound of little kids going, yay! That's what I would be playing right now on the soundboard if I uh, had prepared. Rosemary, I, lo I love it. I love it whenever they write in and they say, yeah. this thing worked. That's great. Yeah, it is so good. Um, and so thank you, Daniel, first of all, for letting us know. And secondly, for implementing it. And yeah, it was really good to, uh, to hear from you. And I'm very glad that I, I could solve your problems. So uh, there we go. The next one comes from Marshall. Marshall writes, hi. I'm a bus operator and would like to use the work focus on my iPhone. I'm trying to find a way to automate it, but getting stuck. My work start location is the same, but I don't stay at one location for my work day, so I can't set it by location because it'll turn off after I leave the location. Is there a way I can turn the focus on or off based on a calendar event? Thank you, Marshall. And now Rosemary has some stuff to share with us. Yeah, I do. So, um, you know, there there's a couple of things here, and I do just want to uh, pop into the the standard uh, settings. I know, Marshall, you've already looked at this, but for people who aren't familiar, so in settings under focus, you've got different focus modes. People will notice my podcasting focus here. That's custom, and you can create custom ones by tapping the plus and going through and creating a completely custom one if you want. Um, but we already have by default. Uh, do not disturb driving personal sleep and work and work is the one that Marshall is wanting to use. So I'm presuming that Marshall's already gone through and, and set things up here. Um, and then there's the schedule and automations option. Now I'm guessing by the fact that Marshall uh, started with um, the location option that he probably doesn't have a fixed working time, which is a little bit of a shame because if he did have a fixed working time, well, that might make life a little bit easier. Um, but what um, you can do is you can enable things for, um, you know, your location. Please don't worry, people. I, I changed my address before every show so that whenever my address shows up, it's the wrong address. Um, you can do times. Obviously, this doesn't work. And you can also do app-based things. So this is perhaps more useful for, say, the reading focus mode than it is for work, uh, unless you use exactly the same app for the when you start work every single day. Um, you can also do smart activation, where it's just going to try and figure it out. Um, and I, if you haven't given that a go, Marshall, I would suggest giving it a try uh, because that might well work for you. Um, and, you know, it's certainly worth giving it a shot because the next option I have is perhaps not the most insane option of them all. 
but it's also not the most automated, which is a bit of a shame. So I'm going to, you know, I'll just delete my smart activation option here because I, I don't want that for, for my work mode. I, I work at the same time every single day, but I want to pop into shortcuts because inside of shortcuts, we've got some automations. Um, and so what you can do is you can create an automation. Um, and what I would suggest is you create an automation for when you turn work on uh, to enable an alarm. Because an alarm is one of these things where if I pop back to the shortcuts uh, uh, triggers, then you can see uh, when uh, an alarm gets turned off is one of the possible triggers. Uh, there it is, sorry. Uh, when an alarm is stopped. So there can be any alarm, specifically your wake up alarm, that's not what we want, or an existing alarm. Um, and then you can, you can select uh, from your existing alarms. And what I would like to do, if it's possible, is to modify your existing alarm. So I we, this one only came in just before the show. So I've not had um, a lot of time to play with this. So first thing that we would want to do is to look in the alarm action. And there is an option to edit an alarm. Perfect. So um, you, can, you can just uh, run that and then it will allow you to edit an alarm. Um, and let me just show info on this. It says perform the action, edit alarm in clock. Okay. Wonderful. So now when work turns on, it'll come up to edit an alarm, turn off as before running. Okay. And I'm just going to toggle my podcasting mode back on because I accidentally enabled the uh, uh, work mode when I was uh, playing with that just now. So now whenever I turn work on, um, it will actually take me to the editing. So let's do this. Work, uh, tap out of the work thing, and then it should pop me into editing an alarm, unless, of course, I managed to uh, break that by by messing with things. Oop, that's a different uh, focus mode uh, option. Um, mm -hmm. Something has gone wrong here. There we go. I will uh, edit this again. So I will I will do this with a different focus mode because uh, I I'm obviously uh, using focus modes right now, which makes it a little more difficult. So we need our edit alarm action. Add this, uh, tap next, turn off ask before running, don't ask, done. So now I switch over to my podcasting and then bam, I'm in edit alarms. Okay. And you're, you're wondering what, where I'm going with this, but I've got an end of work alarm in here. Um, and if you tap on this and you could just adjust it to the right time for your end of work. And I would set the sound to none probably because you're, you're probably not going to want uh, this to happen, and especially I, if you're anything like the other bus drivers I know, Marshall, you're going to be making sure that your route is finished uh, so that you can get home and you, you're probably not going to want too many intrusive automations running. So next we create another personal uh, automation for when an existing alarm is stopped. That's our end of work alarm. Okay. And then we just need to modify our focus mode. So I've got an app called focus in here. I've got OmniFocus, set focus, so we want to turn work off and that's it. Turn off us before running. And so now whenever you stop your work um, uh, alarm, then that is going to turn off. So I am just going to quickly modify this to hopefully trigger in the next few seconds. Um, and then when I turn this off, I think I've just missed it. Dang it. Uh, but then when I turn this off, then it will turn my focus mode off. So this isn't perfect. Unfortunately, there is no way to link this to calendar uh, events, Marshall. I really wish you could. I really wish you could just say, hey, focus mode, anytime there's an event in this particular calendar, please go ahead and turn things on when the event starts, turn it off when the event stops or add a five minute buffer to each one, whichever, you know, something like that. That's on my wish list for next year. That's very high on my wish list. Uh, but this is unfortunately the best I can think of doing um, because otherwise every time you turn an alarm off, it will turn off your focus mode. And if you do use other alarms, for example, during your shift or, um, you know, as part of your day, turning off your focus mode is probably not great. Um, so let's uh, just give this a moment to see if uh, this is going to switch over to the next minute. There we go. End of work. Stop. And there we go. It, it ran my automation. Uh, there is uh, a little bug. This is in the, the newest iOS 15 beta, but it is no longer 
in focus mode. Let's just swipe down from the top and look, my focus mode is gone. I'm going to put that in back into podcasting, Micah, because I think that that is uh, perhaps a little uh, too uh, crazy <laughs> to get too many notifications while I'm uh, podcasting. But that that's how I would work around it, Marshall. I know it's not perfect. I'm really sorry. I wish there was just a way to say, hey, turn this on and then in eight hours, turn it off or seven hours or however long your shifts are. Um, but uh, there doesn't appear to be, which is really frustrating. Come on, Apple, you can you can do better with this. I agree. This should be uh, an easier thing to do, uh, especially because I hear a lot of people asking for this method yeah. of uh, doing things. So, <sighs> yeah. sigh. Yes, I did actually want to demonstrate something because I know that um, a lot of people keep asking for um, ways to uh, handle their calendars between work and personal. And, um, you know, they're there's some, you know, good ways to do this and there's some bad ways to do this. And usually just copying, for example, your entire work calendar into your personal calendar is probably going to break some kind of data privacy rule that you've got at work. So I've come up with a way to handle adding events to both my personal calendar and my work calendar at the same time without leaking my personal information into my work life. Um, and so to do this, I have a very simple shortcut with two actions. Um, and the first action is adding a calendar event. And then the second action is adding another calendar event. Um, and so I'm going to run this to demo it. And to start with, it's going to ask me for the title of the event. So I'll just tap cancel and show you. So when we have um, add a calendar event, it asks us to input some important information about this. It asks us to input the text, uh, which is the title of the calendar event, a date and time for the start, and a date and time for the end. And what I've done with each of these is I've tapped into the field and I've put in this magic variable that comes in at the top next to uh, above your keyboard row called ask each time, which means every time I run this shortcut, it's going to ask me for this information and then put it straight in there. And so it'll ask me for the, the title of the event, the start time and the end time. Um, and then it'll add this to my personal calendar, which is called general. And then it takes this information and it adds an event called personal to uh, my calendar, which is my work calendar with the, the same start and end time. And I know that for a lot of people, if you've got a doctor's appointment or something, you don't necessarily want all of those details landing in your work uh, calendar, but just having a personal appointment in there that's usually good enough. Um, and so this is one way uh, to do this. Now, I did this, I showed some friends and one of them immediately said, I need a 15 minute buffer on either side of this or a five minute buffer or something. So as well, we'll put a link in the show notes to um, an option uh, here where you can do the same thing and then it modifies the start date and takes away 10 minutes, modifies the end date and adds 10 minutes. And then it adds that personal event to your calendar. And it's just going to be 10 minutes longer at either end. And I know quite a few people have been asking for something like this for a while. Uh, so I thought I would just show that on the show. I love it. I'm glad that uh, you were able to ask about, or I mean, you're able to give people an answer for that. All right, yeah. folks, we uh, we have our feedback questions and app caps coming up next on the show. All right, it is time for a question. Edwin in Melbourne asks, since updating to... Let me make sure that I do. Yeah, good. I didn't see the rest of that. Uh, since updating to iOS 15, if I'm in the same room as a HomePod that is playing music, if my phone is locked for more than one minute and I go to unlock it, I get media controls on the home screen. If I turn off wireless under settings, not just hitting the button on control center, music continues to play and the controls go away. From what I've tested so far, if there is another HomePod playing music elsewhere in the house and you move to that location, the phone doesn't reset to give you media controls for that device. It's like it locks locks to the first HomePod that you came across to play media. Thank goodness it doesn't automatically airplay to that device. So if you open YouTube, the audio comes out of the phone and the streaming music keeps playing on the HomePod. Any thoughts on how I can turn this unwanted feature off? I can at least turn off auto launch audio apps on my watch so that it doesn't take over my watch as well when I raise my wrist, but I'd love to turn it off my on my iPhone 12 Pro Max and my partner's 11 Pro also running iOS 15. Yes, Edwin, the good news is there is a way to disable this feature um, in the settings app. We've included a link uh, to the How to Geek article that talks about it. Um, yeah. I personally like this feature, but you can turn it off if you don't like it. 
Yeah, yeah. I do just want to quickly show people because sometimes, um, you know, devices are playing media and you want to control them, but you aren't on the right device. So the way I always do this, Mikey, you might actually have a better way, um, is swipe down into the control center. And then this now playing option shows up here. If you tap and hold on this, then it, it shows you what's now playing on your device. But even if you've got something playing on your device, you can tap down here at the bottom, control other devices, um, and then you can play and pause things elsewhere. Now, if your device is, con you know, has got these controls on it and you don't want them, then you can actually just tap um, on on your iPhone at the top there. Um, and it should theoretically then get rid of this information on the lock screen. So, I mean, it, it, it's one of these things where I think most of the time, like you can, you can get away with doing that. If you do it a couple of times, it should fail to pick it up. I've done that enough times that it now doesn't do it when I want it to, uh, which is slightly frustrating when I'm sitting here at my desk um, and the speaker in the hallway is still playing music from the morning and I'm there going, oh, darn it, I need to turn that off. Um, so uh, yes, I, I, I wish that uh, it was better about picking which speaker to control automatically. Uh, but, you know, it, it, we have options, so. Yes, indeed. Um, that's exactly how I go about it. I thought that there was an even more in-depth setting to do that. But the problem is uh, it's kind of a, a to kill all switch. So by turning yeah. off kind of the handoff controls, you won't get access to some of the other features that you might want. Yes. Yeah. Which is a shame. Um, our next question comes from MJ and I'm just going to give a, a little summary of what MJ has said, which is basically when trying to set up two-factor authentication in the Instagram app, it tries to punt you to certain applications that it wants you to use. And if you don't have one of them installed, uh, then it's just not going to let you continue. And even if you do download and install one of those, it's going to like force you into using that app. And uh, MJ would like to use LastPass, who sponsored uh, Twit before, um, to uh, set this up and would like to know how to do this. I've got really good news for you, MJ, because I recently fixed my two-factor authentication not being enabled on Instagram, which is you can do this the bad news is, is what, if you need to uh, change your Instagram settings uh, or not change your Instagram settings, but when you go to set this up, which of course is a little difficult to do for me because I have two factor authentication enabled, um, is to um, you, there's a link at the bottom where you can then get a code, which you have to type in on another device, which is very frustrating. And you type it in, you get the whole URL, you paste it, um, and then um, you, you should be good to go. Um, so two-factor authentication on Instagram, it's under um, settings uh, and then security, two-factor authentication. Uh, I have it enabled um, so you can get some backup codes and everything. If I disable this, it's going to make me go through the entire flow again. But there is an option when you go to enable it to uh, get that, that URL, which you then need to paste into LastPass or 1Password or whatever your password manager of choice is to enable two-factor authentication there. Yay. And it's so important to uh, get that enabled. Um, yes. All right. I think, uh, oh, we have one more. Um, this is from Steve. Steve writes, hi, I have a 2012 fourth gen iPad with 16 gigabytes of storage. I'm sure I cannot sell it for much, so I'm looking for ways to repurpose it. Maybe turn it into a single use device somewhere in my home. I know it could become something like a digital photo frame or cookbook, but do you have any recommendations or ways you have used your old iPads? Thanks so much. Steve, what a fantastic question. Uh, in fact, let me grab something out of this drawer here. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Dramatic music plays. <laughs> so one of the things that I think is really cool, uh, and, and Steve, this might not work so much for you if you don't have a lot of smart home stuff, but um, I think that it can be really handy to have a device that is purpose built to just act as a um, smart home control center. And Elago uh, makes this great thing called a home hub mount for the iPad. Um, and we can show the website too once it's uh, once we get there. Um, and what it does is it installs on a wall and it's just these little bars that go on the top and bottom. So it comes with this great uh, paper template for different sizes of iPads. And so that way you can make sure that you get it exactly right. Um, and then you can put the thing on the wall and slide the iPad into it. It also comes with uh, cable management. It's got this little cable management button that you can use uh, with it. And then if you wanted to go this far, you could even um, get a, uh, a, a, 
the ability to use it with a recessed receptacle, essentially. So you could wire it uh, so that it kind of plugs in in the back, and then you would just use a right angle uh, plug with it. The cool thing about iPad is, especially if you put it on um, very low brightness, you aren't going to have too much of an issue being able to use it uh, as kind of an always on screen. And it should last you quite a long time. There are lots of different uh, companies that have iPads as their terminals and they last for years and years and years. So that's one option. I'm curious, Rosemary, mm -hmm. if you have any other thoughts. Well, I, one thing, I, one caveat I would mention, if you're planning on setting it up as, um, you know, say, for example, a HomeKit controller for smart home devices, is don't set the iPad up as a HomeKit hub if you've already got HomeKit hubs, because it ends up being the slowest one out of the lot and it severely de degrades your experience. And my, you know, I've, I've had a couple of friends go, yeah, I'll, I'll set up an extra iPad as a, an extra HomeKit hub and everything slows down to a crawl. And as soon as they disable it and it just goes back to using Apple TVs, HomePods, HomePod minis, everything speeds up again. Um, so, you know, obviously, as Steve's mentioned, digital photo frames and cookbooks are two great ways. You could have it as a dedicated reading device, um, of course. Um, and if you've got um, smart cameras or, or internet connected cameras, then you could, of course, use it to uh, display the streams from those. Uh, my favorite app for this on iOS is HomeCam, uh, which we talked about, I think it was last week or the week before, um, which is a really great application. Um, but, um, you know, there there are some other options too. Um, I have found um, sometimes it's nice to have a dedicated uh, streaming device on my desk so that I can uh, have like, you know, things just show up um, and just play, you know, like little clips of stuff that are just, you know, as background information or noise but pretty much while I'm working. And because the iPad screen is smaller, it's not taking up a whole extra monitor. You know, I've got a 24 inch monitor here. Sure. But if I put Babylon 5 on that while I'm working, then I'm going to be watching Babylon 5. I'm not going to be working. But if I'm, you know, if I put something like that on, an, on a small iPad, then I will, you know, pretty much ignore it. And it is just background noise, which is quite nice. Um, the other thing, of course, you could do is use it as a dedicated streaming device for things like zoo streams. Lots of zoos have got really great streams of cute animals and stuff. So you you could, uh, you know, watch pandas play all day or something like that on it. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uses for it. Um, if you've got PDFs that you need to read, it's a great PDF reader. You can try using it uh, as a second display, but I am not sure if the fourth generation iPad supports a recent enough version of iOS to work with Sidecar. Um, so you would need to check out whether or not that that's going to work for you. But I, I often just end up using uh, these things as uh, devices around the house, floating around with, uh, you know, dedicated images or videos showing on them. And of course, I have one in the kitchen, which has got all of my recipes on there. Nice. Yes. The recipe book is a great way to do it. All right, folks, we have reached almost the end of the show. That means it is time for App Caps. This is the part of the show where we wear caps atop our heads to honor our picks of the week. These may be apps or gadgets we're using now or have used in the past that we want to share with all of you because we think they are great. All right, Rosemary Orchard, tell me about the cap atop your head and your pick of the week. Well, the hat atop my head is actually a hat that I wear on a regular basis. Uh, it is a lovely pale pink beret. It's coming across kind of uh, grayish in the light. It's got some nice little uh, sparkly bits in there, which is really good fun. Uh, and my app cap this week is a little bit of a cheat because uh, some friends of mine developed this, but it's available for free. So that is always a, a great thing. And the app is called Elsewhen. So I don't know about you, Micah, but time zones are pretty difficult to deal with, especially when I've got to communicate with other people about those times. So for example, if I want to tell everybody that iOS Today next week is going to be at a different time, well, that's going to be the time in my time zone. But what about their times? To be clear, it's not a different time next week. Last week, it was a different time, though. Well, Elswen is designed to help you deal with this problem, specifically with Discord, but also there, there's a timeless option. Um, and so if I want to tell everybody about something that's going to be happening at, say, 7 p.m. my time, then I'll just scroll through to 7 p.m. here. 
And I can see that currently it's going to show 26th of October, 2021 at 7 p.m. Or I can change it to Tuesday, 26th of October, 2021, uh, just 26th of October, 2021 with no time, just the time, the time with the seconds, or I can add uh, a relative time with this as well. Um, so that I can say, for example, 26th of October at 1900 in 32 minutes. Um, and what is great about this, of course, now, if I copy this and then I pop over to Discord, so this is the Club Tote Discord, and some people have been posting some nice links there during the show. Now, if I paste this here, it kind of just looks like some weird text, right? But now if I hit send, then it shows people that exact time. But Micah, if you look at this time, it actually shows you the time in your local time zone. Um, because Ooh, Discord's got this what? feature where these times can actually be translated. And so you would see That's it in your local cool. time zone. So it won't show 7 p.m. for you. It'll show in 32 minutes. That's still the same. But um, you can, you know, you'll actually see a different time there. Now, of course, not everybody uses Discord. And there we go. Anthony's showing it as uh, 11 a.m. in the Twitch studio. Perfect. Not everyone uses Discord. So Discord's not the perfect way to communicate. Fine, elsewhere can handle that. If you switch over at the bottom to the time list, then you can set your time here instead. Um, and so again, I'll set it to 7 p.m. And you can choose your favorite time zones. Um, and so I've got America, Los Angeles, America, Chicago, America, New York, Europe, London, and Europe, Rome. And now if I copy this and then I open, say for example, the drafts application, and then I just paste this here, I have a list with some flags oh. on which shows My me God. the exact time in all of the places everywhere because this app I is need amazing. this app. It's free to download from the App Store. It's called Elsewhere. Um, and it is pretty great. So I know uh, Mike Curley, who is a friend of yours and mine, uh, uses this to post his Friday uh, keyboard uh uh, Twitch stream time so that everybody knows what time uh, there it is going to be at in their local time zone. It handles daylight savings. Uh, it's got light mode and dark mode. You can add your own favorite time zones. You can have uh, different emojis showing for different time zones, depending on your preferences, etc. It can do so many things. And honestly, I love it. Uh, and of course, don't forget, there's a little button in the top right to switch it back to the now time uh, if you want to. So you can do that. But yeah, it's, it's a really just cute, really single function app for sharing time, but translating it to wherever your friends and family are. And uh, is there I know a for me tip and you, jar? There is not a tip jar, uh, but I want to uh, give I these. Believe, I know. Uh, so there, it's a little bit complicated because there's a group of people who've worked on this open source. Um, and so the last time I checked, they said if you would like uh, to support them, then please donate some money to the St. Jude campaign. Um, so oh. because that's when they were uh, developing a lot of things together. So uh, yes, I will double check. But uh, yeah, it's a great, great, great application, which at least for me and you, Micah, it's incredibly useful. Oh my goodness, so useful. I love it. And it's just, it's like the exact things that you need and nothing more. That's what I love. Exactly. It's not all this extra exactly. cruft and weird no. graphs and stuff. No, it just does no, what you no, need to no do. No ads, nothing. It just is an app that shares time that gets translated. Lovely. And it's got shortcut support. Of course, of course it does. Of course, of course. All right, folks. Um, I am loving this weather right now. It's chilly. It's uh, the, the leaves are turning. And so I have a fall cap atop my head with uh, different, I think it's roses and sort of leaves and whatnot for the fall. Um, the app that I want to talk about is one that I think is going to make a lot of people feel a little nostalgic. Perhaps you recognize this music. This, folks, is It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, in app form, available on the App Store. You tap on the book, and it is narrated by the voice of Charlie Brown. Yes, the original voice of Charlie Brown is narrating this book. I will tap uh, this text here. Oh, you didn't. And then you can tap on the individual uh, words to have that um, sort of played back, but you can also just tap on the... Oh, you didn't tell me you were going to kill it. ...to see what's there. And then here we go. It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Written by Charles M. Schultz. Narrated by Peter Robbins, the original voice of Charlie Brown. Peter Robbins. And then as we scroll through the book... It was a brisk autumn pop -ups day. pop-ups pop up. it wasn't just any autumn day. 
and the Halloween. text highlights as uh, Peter is reading. Charlie finished raking a big pile of leaves. And you can see these fun little animations. I'm uh, currently tapping on that pile of leaves, and as I shake it, little leaves pop out. I can also shake Charlie and Snoopy here, and then I can go on to the next page by scrolling. <laughs> Linus is headed to that leaf pile. Never jump into a pile of leaves with a wet sucker. <laughs> now there are leaves all over his lollipop and on his face. It looks like he's got a beard. And of course, Charlie and Snoopy are rolling their eyes. And then you get this kind of final look. Never jump into a pile of leaves with a wet sucker. <laughs> and then you can swipe onto the next Lucy page. Stopped by with her football. And it goes on and on uh, from here. Each of the little people are kind of interactive, in, and uh, the story kind of unfolds on each page, almost like a comic book in a way, where as opposed to each page kind of being separate, there are different chunks of story that get told on the page as you go. Um, I think this would be fantastic if you wanted to share Charlie Brown with, uh, with you know, your, your kids or other young folks. Um, and it can just be fun for yourself to scroll through, uh, to swipe through. So this this is available for $4.99 in the App Store. Uh, One-time purchase to get the, the whole storybook. Um, and it's called Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown. You can get it for iPad or iPhone. Currently number three in books. I'm not surprised. Uh, very fun. And as I said, uh, just a fun nostalgic look back at old Charlie Brown who apparently is Irish all of a sudden. I don't know. Folks, um, <laughs> we have reached the end of another episode of iOS Today. So that means I can tell you, you should email us, iOStoday at twit.tv, where you can send your questions, your feedback, your concerns. If you haven't had your question answered yet and you did send one in, it is possible that it came in before Rosemary joined the show and did a very cool thing of uh, making all of us, all of the collections come in. So don't feel bad about resending your question uh, because because that's on me. <laughs> and also, and so if you sent it more recently and, and it got a little lost, then there was uh, potentially a little window where the automations weren't quite working as good as they should have been to get everything into our little database. Uh, so please, if we did miss something, feel free to send it in. That said, uh, we do have uh, quite a few tips or requests in, in the uh, notes uh, already for the future, um, both for uh, general questions and also shortcuts corner but if we've missed yours and you want to make sure you get it in feel free to send it again no problem there and uh, you should watch the show live if you would like. Uh, that's a fun way to tune in and see the bloopers and uh, the no bones days that uh, today has uh, has been. Um, and by doing that, you just head to twit.tv slash live every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, 1600 UTC. Oh, I should have used elsewhere. I could tell you some more or else when I could tell you some more uh, times that we record live. But we think the best way to get the show is by subscribing to the show. And you do that by going to twit.tv slash iOS, where you can subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. Uh, you just click subscribe to audio, subscribe to video, and you choose the uh, feed that you want, the different service that you want, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. We try to be in all of those places. Um, there's also a great thing we have. It's called Club Twit. For seven bucks a month, you get access to every Twit show with no ads, uh, plus the exclusive Twit Plus bonus feed that has content you won't find anywhere else. That's behind the scenes, above the scenes, before the scenes, under the scenes, around the scenes. It's all sorts of fun content uh, that you would enjoy, enjoy that you wouldn't otherwise get. So really cool there. And then my favorite thing, we talked about Discord earlier. You get access to the members only Discord server where you can hang out with all of us and chat and chat with your fellow Club Twit members as well. All of that available for just seven bucks a month. Very cool. Uh, by the way, if you are tuning in 
via Apple Podcasts. Well, there's another great thing. We got some feedback that some folks didn't really want to pay the seven bucks, uh, not interested in, in the whole kit and caboodle, but wanted to support their favorite shows directly. Well, there's a great way to do that now. In Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe to the audio feed of the show by going in Apple Podcasts, finding the audio feed of iOS Today, and you'll see a button that says subscribe. Uh, for $2.99 a month, you'll get an ad-free version of the audio uh, podcast. So a pretty great way to kind of pick and choose the ones you want to sponsor directly. Um, I think we're just about there. I just need to ask Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to uh, follow you online and check out all your great work, where do they go to do so? Uh, the best place to go is to rosemaryorchard.com, uh, where there are links to all the things I do and some other things. I'm going through the process of collecting a backlog of posts that went missing at one point and getting them all back on the site. Um, so yeah, there's lots of things there. And of course, you can find me on Twitter and micro.blog with the username Rosemary Orchard. Micah, what about you? I can be found at Micah Sargent on many a social media network, or you can head to chihuahua.coffee, that's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. A uh, great way to uh, check out the different stuff there. Folks, thank you for tuning in to yet another episode of iOS today. We appreciate you. We love you. And we hope that you have a great spooky Halloween if you celebrate that. Goodbye, everyone. If you find yourself talking to those virtual assistants in your house quite often, or maybe you can make your light turn on and off with the touch of a button, well, Smart Tech Today is the show for you. Join Matthew Casanelli and myself, Micah Sargent, every week as we talk all about smart stuff and the fun that comes along with it. <laughs>